Okay, uh, warm welcome to everybody on this uh, special uh, event today. Uh, as we all know, today, 28th of February, as every year, uh, we are celebrating the National Science Day to celebrate the discovery of the Raman effect, uh, which led to, of course, the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in the year 1930. Uh, we also know the history of it a little bit, so I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, uh, Dr. Raman, Professor Raman was, of course, intrigued by the blue color of the Mediterranean during his uh, trip to Europe in 1921. Uh, and like a, a phenomenal researcher, he uh, uh, took that forward through a series of experiments and, of course, a lot of thinking and, and eventually led to the discovery of the, the Raman effect. Uh, the beautiful biography of, of uh, Sir C. V. Raman, uh, for those of you who have read, uh, tells the whole story very, very wonderfully. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many of us have, have read it and know about it. So uh, let me not spend too much time on it. Uh, what I want to do say is that uh, uh, India celebrates National Science Day on this particular day uh, with a theme. And in uh, this year, 2022, the theme is integrated approach in science and technology for sustainable future. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought that there would be nobody better today uh, to celebrate this particular theme than our esteemed speaker today, Professor Ambuj Sagar. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Ambuj. Uh, Ambuj is the uh, founding head of the School of Public Policy at the IIT Delhi. Uh, he is uh, as the uh, uh, the uh, flyer that we have sent out, he's of he's also the Vipula Mahesh Chaturvedi Professor of Policy Studies uh, at the IIT Delhi. Uh, his uh, research interests lie at the inter intersection of science, technology, policy, and development, with particular focus on climate change, energy transitions, and sustainability. All three extremely important topics uh, in, in today's world. Uh, he's a very decorated and very well known uh, and very well sought after uh, policy expert. Uh, you can see his association with a large number of uh, Indian as well as uh, uh, foreign uh, think tanks and agencies. So he's a board member of the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, a member of the Indo-German expert group on green and inclusive economy, uh, he was the board member of the U.S. India Educational Foundation uh, and a member of the U.S. India Track to Dialogue on Climate and Energy. Uh, I hear that he was also a staff member on an important policy paper uh, on energy that he created for, uh, for the team created for, for the White House. Uh, he is a member of the Indian Planning Commission's Expert Committee on Low Carbon Strategy for Inclusive Growth. Uh, He's basically, a, uh, you know, as his educational background, he's a mechanical engineer, did his B.Tech in mechanical engineering from IIT Delhi, followed by a master's in aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, and then uh, uh, our paths must have crossed because he uh, did his master's in material science, a PhD in polymer science, which is, of course, very close to my heart. So uh, to that extent, uh, uh, we share the same passion uh, in polymer science technology. But he went beyond that and uh, had a master's in technology and policy from, from MIT. Uh, he was a senior research associate at the Harvard Kennedy School and the assistant dean for strategic planning at the Harvard Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, all of that before he joined IIT Delhi's Department of Humanities and, and Social Sciences. Uh, his recent work has focused on innovation policy for meeting sustainability and inclusivity challenges, particularly on energy innovation policies and strategies, climate change policy and politics. Uh, he's also interested in capacity development and in general on higher education policy. Uh, I just want to say one final thing that was very important to me. He was the lead author on the technical summary and chapter four, uh, which was on sustainable development and equity of the IPCC's assessment report number five and uh, uh, particularly of the work group three uh, and the work group three uh, is is very important because it assesses the literature on 
scientific, technological, environmental, economic and social aspects related to mitigation of, of climate change. And, and these kinds of reports are uh, extremely important because they pave the way for policy changes, both at local uh, and uh, international levels, uh, as well as for short term and long term policy. So this kind of very rigorous analysis uh, of various uh, dimensions of uh, climate change is, is extremely important to make sure that we have the right policies in place. So clearly Ambuj is a thought leader, has huge experience and deep knowledge uh, in various dimensions of these very complex problems that we are dealing with today. So as I said, for today's theme of the National Science Day, we couldn't have found a better speaker than, than Ambuj. So Ambuj, it's an absolute delight for us to have you on this call. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to you Ambuj. Uh, the platform is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ashish. Um, I should, before I get to the presentation, I should uh, just by way of context of your introduction, I should say that I would like, I, I would like to suggest to the audience that they uh, go with the facts and not with the adjectives that Ashish has used for me. I'm, um, I, I don't, I don't think I'm worthy of all those adjectives, but I'm. It is true that I actually have a background in science and engineering as this and, and has then moved into public policy. So I do think about questions at the intersection of science and technology and development and sustainability. And with today's talk, I think I'm going to hopefully be able to present at least some thoughts on uh, both opportunities and challenges in one particular dimension, which is this clean energy transition that's um, that we're, that's undergoing that, that the world is undergoing currently uh, and also think about how are we doing in that domain and uh, maybe reflect just very briefly on how I, how we might do better um, so with that let me just uh, share my screen if I can it's always here we go all right uh, can you guys see my screen Yes, I'm good. Then in the meanwhile, while the slides are going on, let me maybe just get the ball rolling. I'm sorry that it's just taken so much time to do this. But uh, um, as I was saying that, uh, that my own interest is at the intersection of science, technology, and, and how to use science and technology to meet uh, the kinds of challenges that the world is facing and uh, actually it's going to continue to face uh, both um, because of um, actually frankly sometimes advances in science and technology and in fact what i'm going to be talking about uh, as soon as the slides come up which is the clean energy transition really is in some sense motivated by our own um, success at using uh, science and technology to uh, use fossil fuels as a um, major energy source in the last couple of centuries, uh, but in ways that are very, very inefficient, uh, leading to, as you all know, air pollution, but also global climate pollution, which is uh, driving climate change. Uh, and I say driving because we're already seeing the results of climate change and the concerns that it's going to become much worse. So in some sense, science and technology is both has been part of the problem. Uh, but of course, in the process, it's made life much better for people across the world or a lot of people across the world. Um, but we are now also beginning to realize that that some of these side effects of the benefits of science and technology and the modern energy uh, are, are basically unsustainable and untenable. And the question is, what are we going to do about that? Um, the story, of course, becomes much more complicated for a country such as India because uh, we also have not just something to worry, something like climate change to worry about, but a lot of other development imperatives. And uh, what I will try to get at, at the talk in the next half an hour or so is to just get a sense of what are the challenges facing us. Uh, and uh, us as in India and the globe, uh, what are possibly some of the opportunities as we make our way through this clean energy transition that will be 
ongoing for the next many decades. And, um, and then, as I said, some thoughts on how we in India could, could do better. Uh, but I do want to kind of say that this is a multi-decadal story and it's not something that's going to get resolved uh, in the next um, few years. But that does not mean we don't have to start worrying about it now because in some senses, especially given the nature of the um, energy system, with a long, um, with a long time for infrastructure um, and its and the potential therefore for lock-in, uh, we can't really be be taking it easy. Even though the problem is going to take a few decades to to resolve itself, I think it's pretty clear that um, we all need to start moving much more quickly. And some of that action has started happening. I'll, I'll show you some of that in my slides. But as I said, um, a much longer way to go. So anyway, um, I don't know if Ashish has had any success at loading the slides. Great, thank you very much. So I, um, as I already kind of gave you a sneak preview uh, while, while the slides are coming up, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, the clean energy transition, uh, opportunities and challenges. I'm going to start by laying out uh, an Indian, the, what I'm calling the Indian energy context. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just going through a lot of information. So I, I hope there'll be time for Q&A in case you have any questions or doubts, but I basically want to start with um, our, our current plans for the energy transition in India. And the numbers that I have up on the screen uh, are basically the numbers announced by Prime Minister Modi at the Glasgow COP a couple of months ago, a few months ago. Uh, uh, where it said renewables should account for 50% of the energy by 2030. Actually, I think it might have meant uh, uh, electricity um, by 2030. Uh, 500 gigawatt of total renewables capacity by 2030. We are at about 100 gigawatts uh, now. Um, reduce the carbon intensity of the economy. That is the amount of carbon emitted per unit GDP by 45% by 2030 and net zero. That is no net emissions by 2070. As you can imagine, these are extremely, extremely ambitious um, uh, uh, goals. Uh, renewables are about 10% of our, our power uh, today. So we are really talking about a massive ramp up of renewables, but along with renewables, basically effectively a whole rejiggering of the full energy sector. And we can, we'll come back to that later. But as we do that, um, beyond just moving towards clean energy, we also have a lot of other energy challenges facing the country relating to uh, the four items of what I have on the screen here, expansion, access, affordability, and modernity. And I'm gonna use the next few slides to illustrate some of these. Next, please. Uh, this slide basically shows the total energy supply per capita uh, in a number of key countries uh, and um, uh, aggregates. OECD and the world. Uh, and the reason I'm starting with this slide is uh, effectively, energy supply is very closely linked to human development. Uh, there's not, a, obviously, there's not a, a causal relationship in the fact that you can actually use a lot of energy very inefficiently and not necessarily uh, result in any great increase in, in um, people's uh, lives. Um, improving people's lives, but the the corollary uh, or the contrary that improving people's well-being without using energy is something we've not tracked so far. So in other words, if you want to improve people's well-being across the world, we are going to have to use energy. How efficiently we use it is another story, but certainly we cannot not uh, use it. So in other words, there's not been a decoupling of energy use and, and human well-being. And uh, as we can see, even globally, um, we are using about two tons of oil equivalents uh, per person per year, uh, and India is actually much lower. So we're certainly going to have to be expanding our energy supplies in the coming years to make sure that people actually have, people across the country have adequate uh, energy available to them for uh, underpinning all of the things that, you know, whether it's actually communication, transportation, lighting, space conditioning, uh, uh, industry, uh, agriculture, all of that is actually underpinned by energy. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, here is a, a question of how efficiently we're using energy to translate that into uh, economic outcome. And again, I've put a number of countries here. You can see China was actually extremely inefficient in the has been extremely inefficient in the last few decades, and but has done a remarkable job at uh, improving its the energy intensity of its economy. India actually does quite well, as you can see. We are uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, right in the middle of kind of a global global trends, and also we have been improving the energy intensity of our economy quite significantly in the past few uh, decades. Next, please. The next slide. Yeah, the next slide. Oh, please. Sorry. Yeah, the next slide. I, I talk about the electricity consumption per capita, and I want to point uh, focus on that specifically because uh, increasingly, energy ha electricity has become such a key part of our energy supply as an as a very versatile energy carrier that more and more of the energy being used in modern industrialized economies really is apart from transportation which is still fossil fuel based uh, uh, electric power really is uh, underpins a lot of a lot of activities and also it's a very clean source at least at the end uh, and uh, for for end use and therefore it is seen as uh, power consumption per capita is really seen as a key indicator of um, access to modern energy sources and again as you will see india has done quite well uh, in, in the last few um, decades in improving the amount of power availability to people, but we still, again, have a long way to go. China, the red line actually uh, is really kind of, a, kind of is, a, is a kind of the a poster boy of a developing country massively increasing the power availability to its people. Next slide, please. Um, and something else I talked about, I talked about um, questions of access. I just want to put something up there, up here, which is uh, uh, effectively access to clean cooking energy across the world. And um, this, this slide from the International Energy Agency really shows all the key um, developing countries that are still relying on uh, biomass or coal for, uh, for cooking. Uh, turns out to be a very big problem in terms of health impacts. Uh, there are millions of excess uh, mortalities uh, linked to um, air pollution from uh, uh, dirty cooking. And India is about 50% of the population actually has access to clean cooking facilities uh, according to 2018 data. I, I, should, I should say that we've actually greatly increased the availability of uh, uh, clean energy to cooking energy to people through the LPG. Uh, program, but um, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, next slide. And because I actually started with a kind of a talking about the fact that climate is climate change is one of the more main motivators, I just thought I'd just put up a slide here that talks about CO2 emissions per capita. Uh, and again, you will see, obviously, not surprisingly, because we don't use that much energy, um, which is the main source of uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, we are really fairly low on the CO2 per capita. Uh, as, as we might get to a little bit later on in the discussion is a challenge for India is that because we have a large population, we are seen as a major global emitter of carbon dioxide in the aggregate, even though per capita emissions are very low. So it kind of puts us in a very, uh, a kind of a unique uh, territory of being a low per capita emitter but being a very large aggregate um, emitter, and therefore the global community kind of demanding uh, action of from India as a large uh, emitter as a country, even though on an individual per capita basis we are actually very very, very low. It's 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 actually a, a major part of the kind of the our, our conundrum on how to position ourselves in the global uh, climate policy space. Next slide, please. So uh, now uh, I was talking earlier about India's uh, energy transition ambitions, and basically because uh, the ambition is very large, uh, very high, 
uh, we need the deployment of suitable technologies to be effective, fast, and at scale. So it's a really complicated story because, as I said, you have, we are doing it in a very short time frame, massive scale, and obviously one has to do it effectively in order to get the benefits one wants. There's no point in just kind of you know creating a kind of a, a facade. Nobody wants to do that. What that means it's it's a major deviation from business as usual. Uh, we have to think about how to uh, um, uh, make new and improved technologies available to a whole set of stakeholders. I talked about, gave some examples of the kinds of users of, uh, of energy technologies. It's individuals, it's in buildings, it's industry, it's in agriculture uh, and across the board. And uh, I think as the previous slides would have shown, we need to simultaneously address climate and developmental imperatives. We can't just be trying to solve the climate problem by just saying we're going to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions through clean energy. We have to make sure that as we do this, uh, a large part of the country's citizenry that needs greater access to, to energy uh, is also not left behind. Now, it turns out that successful innovation and diffusion of uh, technologies, actually clean energy technologies, but even other technologies, uh, requires not just making sure that we have the ability to uh, have the technologies available and, and be operated, but also requires suitable kind of economic um, uh, incentives, making finance available, making sure the markets are actually delivering the kind of results we want and the right kind of policy in order to make sure that we are giving the right incentives, but also organizing our whole enterprise in a in a sensible way. And we have to do this all while taking into account, I will keep on emphasizing that, taking into account the local context. How, we, how this happens in the United States is very different from how this happens in India. The social, political, economic, institutional context is different. And as I said, we also have to be very careful to make sure that we are not um, ignoring our uh, de developmental imperatives. And of course, as you can imagine, local human organizational institutional capabilities become absolutely uh, central to this uh, to this uh, uh, process. Next slide, please. And when, again, I'm just restating the say, that point in a, in a certain way, which is true of India, but also true of a large, large lot of emerging and developing economies. It's what I call the four, four C's. The fact that you have multiple challenges and different countries may be actually giving different weights to these challenges. Uh, we have different contexts and capabilities across countries and different countries are going to be making very, very different choices. Just like every other country, India also has to be thinking about all of this as it uh, moves forward. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this uh, in the later part of, of the talk. Next slide, please. So I titled the talk, The Clean Energy Transition Challenges and Opportunities. And so far, I've, I think I've, hopefully I've given you guys a sense of the challenge or the, the multiplicity of challenges and the scale of challenges and the complexity of challenges in front of India. But I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the global opportunity as this uh, energy transition um, happens uh, across the world. Uh, next slide, please. So here is an extract from a recent report by the International Energy Agency uh, talking about uh, running some effectively a set of scenarios about how to reach net zero by 2050, which is the uh, global net zero by 2050, which is um, a kind of an agree a kind of a target that all countries have agreed to uh, in the Paris uh, COP um, uh, a few years ago. Um, well, actually, sorry, at Paris COP pointed towards this. It really was uh, came out of a different IPCC study, but uh, it has now become pretty much uh, a well accepted uh, uh, point in the global climate policy conversation that we really should reach net zero by 2050 globally. The International Energy Agency has this interesting analysis that actually says that if you think about what pathway we need to go on onto that net zero by 2050. By 2030, the deep cuts that are already needed, well, the technologies are already here. And actually many of the policies that are needed to drive the deployment of these technologies are, have already been proven. 
So in some sense, the immediate steps towards net zero 2050, which is really important for meeting the global climate goals, uh, the immediate steps are in some senses doable. The technologies exist. We know what the policies are. Actually, what's more often what's missing is kind of the political kind of uh, uh, ambition to throw weight behind this behind this thing. But we seem to be moving in, in a good direction. But more importantly, uh, what this report says is that if you're thinking about net zero by 2050, almost half of the reductions will come from technologies that are currently at the demonstration or prototype phase. In other words, a huge amount of technology innovation still has to happen if we are to meet that net zero by 2050 goal. And um, I'm not going to read out the full, um, the full quote, but uh, they say, and I think this is particularly, you, uh, particularly of relevance to uh, you folks at NCL, that the biggest innovation opportunities concern advanced batteries, hydrogen electrolyzers, and direct air capture and storage technologies. These really are going to be absolutely central to uh, meeting our net zero goals. Advanced batteries, of course, are going to be very important for energy storage as we move much more towards the global uh, electricity supply coming from renewables that are intermittent. We're going to have to find ways to store them, uh, whether at, at the grid level or whether at a distributed level. We certainly are going to need a great improvement in the batteries. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about using renewable energy to um, uh, uh, basically splitting water to then use hydrogen as another form of a versatile energy carrier, actually a huge amount of interest in this. And India itself has actually not talked about a kind of a hydrogen mission. And the last, which is the direct air capture and storage is basically saying that even with all of our efforts, uh, we are basically on a trajectory where we're releasing much more carbon into the air than, um, than we can manage. So we are gonna to have to find ways of sucking that carbon out and sequestering it in some form or the, or the other. Um, all of these uh, technologies in some sense exist today. There are fairly reasonable batteries that are being used. Companies like Tesla, et cetera, are demonstrating how they might be re uh, leading to an electric vehicle revolution. Uh, we certainly have some hydrogen production capabilities already and some experimental direct air capture uh, and storage technologies. But uh, as the report points out, much, much more to be done. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm just, just to give you a feel, here are some numbers about global investments in renewable power capacity in the last decade across the world. Uh, and you can see that the numbers are actually enormous. We are actually spending approximately uh, between two to $300 billion a year in the last uh, decade uh, in uh, basically driving the deployment well, both the research and deployment in uh, renewable power. The, the, the figures on the screen are only for, only for deployment. But again, you can see China is actually playing a very, very major role here, but it's not the only one. The United States is investing a lot. The European Union is, is, is investing a lot. Um, India is investing something of the, about maybe about a 10th or less than a 10th per year that China is investing. But so fairly significant, some many billions of dollars in India, but we're not one of the leading uh, uh, players. Although in some in some areas, for example, in solar, uh, for a couple of years we really were one of the leader leading deployers. But um, but certainly we are one of the major economies that are that are um, helping with this uh, renewable uh, revolution. Next slide, please. Just again from that IA report, just to give you a sense of by 2030, we have talked about the fact that we have technologies actually available for meeting 2030 goals according to that according to that study. But you can see the goals are actually very ambitious. You're talking about a huge ramp up in terms of uh, renewables capacity, uh, electric car sales, and improving the energy intensity of the GDP much faster than what's ever happened before. Uh, next slide. 
And here also it talks about the clean energy investment in the net zero pathway. Uh, sorry, that little red oval was meant to highlight the fact that the numbers on the uh, y-axis are trillions of US dollars. So we're really talking about a ridiculous amount of annual investment uh, needed in uh, moving towards this net zero pathway. And, and so numbers are actually quite mind boggling. And therefore it just tells you about the size of the market opportunity. We're talking about trillions of dollars being invested in, um, in, um, in moving us uh, down, down, this, down this pathway. Uh, next slide, please. So again, now to step back and say, okay, how is, given this massive opportunity in the challenges, how is the Indian, Indian energy innovation landscape doing? Next slide. Uh, the answer is maybe not as well as we should be. Uh, the Indian national system of innovation, in other words, if you think about innovation, the Indian innovation system, it's really dominated by government agencies, um, um, uh, both in funding and performing. Uh, just to give you a sense of the numbers on the screen, for a country such as Japan, the private sector actually contributes about 75% of the R&D, uh, the gross investments in R&D in, in a country. So, so governments actually play kind of a supporting role in most industrialized economies. They don't really, they're not really the drivers of uh, innovation, although they play a very, very important role in terms of catalyzing and facilitating lots of, lots of innovation. But it's really the private sector that's the main funder and performer of innovation, but not in the Indian case. So that in sense constrains us in many ways, because in the end, this clean energy revolution really has to be driven by industry. The government can facilitate it through some investments and policies, but in the end, it's going to be firms that are going to uh, develop those technologies and deploy them. Uh, as all of you know, these numbers are probably not new to you. Uh, our overall investments in India, R&D, are about 0.7% of GDP and have stayed between 0.7 and 0.8 in the last many decades. Uh, the global average, the global average is 1.7%, which means also including other developing countries. And the developed countries, uh, richer countries are 2.3%. Some of them even do in excess of 4% of their um, GDP invested in R&D. As I mentioned, the private sector R&D in India is low. It has risen fairly rapidly in the last uh, couple of decades, seven times between 2004 and 2017, um, uh, but still a long, long way to go. Our, and our expenditure in education is actually fairly low and we'll, we'll come back to that later on. Uh, sadly, actually, we don't really even have very detailed data available on R&D investments in India. Uh, certainly not uh, in any fine-grained manner on uh, issues relating to energy, but even broadly, I think I would actually say our data is fairly sparse. Um, uh, but anyway, this is uh, at least broadly what, what the data actually tells us. Next slide, please. This is just some graphical representation of how, how India does against in comparison to some of the other major countries. Uh, Brazil, China, and South Africa as, in some sense, comparator uh, developing or emerging economies, and then Japan, Korea, and U.S. as um, kind of leading industrialized uh, 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 economies. And you, as you can see, Korea has massively ramped up its um, uh, R&D investments as a percent of GDP in the last few decades, up to, you know, over 4.5%. Uh, but Japan and the United States, etc., have regularly been spending almost 3% of their uh, uh, gross expenditures in R&D as a percent of, percent of GDP. Um, again, India, as I said, is kind of holding steady around 0.7%. Next slide. That was the percent of GDP. If I one looks at gross expenditure in R&D per capita, you actually see, and by the way, please notice that the y-axis is log scale. And so we are about one and a half orders of magnitude below the leading players. Um, and even China, as you can see, has massively ramped up its R&D investments in, in, in the last, last few decades. So we really have, in some sense, a, a long way to do, go uh, to catch up with these countries if we want to be 
uh, playing the innovation game, uh, especially in the clean energy space. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I, I think we'll come back to this later. This is basically some sense of uh, public energy RD and investments by countries, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, I just want to kind of put up this data on clean energy R&D. Uh, so really, what are the investments we are doing in relationships to uh, clean energy innovation? Actually, maybe not that bad compared to countries such as uh, Brazil and honestly, even Japan. Actually, Japan spends a lot of its R &D, energy R&D investments on nuclear energy, although it started moving away. But if you look at South Korea, United States, and China, that are kind of the leading players in the clean energy game. We're basically spending uh, much less on an absolute amount, but also if you normalize it to a uh, million dollars, US dollars of GDP, we're still about an order of magnitude behind, behind those guys. So effectively, in, in other words, we are really uh, have to ramp up our investments in clean energy R&D significantly if we want to kind of play the clean energy innovation game and, and get some slice of that massive global clean energy market that I had, I had um, uh, shown earlier on, on those slides. Uh, next, next, please. Ah, here is a slide, sorry. It's a little bit of a complicated slide, but again, I'm showing different countries where the solid lines represent a capacity installed of solar energy and the dashed lines are a uh, number of patents. Um, and the only point I want to make here is, I, I guess two points. One is you will see India, which is dark green. And if you look, look at the dashed lines, India's patenting in, um, and patenting is a crude, crude uh, uh, measure of innovation, but for whatever it is worth, we are seeing that India's patenting is, again, log scale, orders of magnitude below the leaders. Um, but secondly, also to note that if you look at the time, the x-axis, pretty much all the other countries started patenting well be before they started deploying. So in other words, they are playing the innovation game well. They actually started investing in science and technology relating to renewables anticipating that renewables will become more important in the future, leading to the, leading to the patenting trends shown here. And then eventually they actually started deploying. Therefore, they're able to use their investments in science and technology to build their industrial base. Uh, India, we actually are, as I noted earlier, we've been deploying air fairly quickly, um, increasing our deployments of solar very, very quickly in the last uh, few years. But in some sense, our rate of increase of deployment has actually preceded our improvements in uh, the kind of the innovation, the fundamental innovation in, these, in, in this technology. Um, uh, next slide. So effectively, I'm coming towards the end of my, uh, end of my talk, but I just want to kind of highlight that um, when we're thinking about the renewables transition, and I think taking renewables as kind of the core of the clean energy transition, uh, to a large extent, our emphasis has been shaped by the, what I'm calling the globally driven climate imperatives. Remember what I talked about earlier was the fact that because we are a major uh, emitting economy, we've come under a lot of pressure in the, in the uh, international arena to take on more and more aggressive uh, um, um, goals for, for clean energy, and that has kind of pushed us to take on these very, very ambitious targets. Of course, they also make sense in many ways. Uh, we also have some of these, what I call green industrialization aspirations. I think our policy documents talk about being able to build these green industries. In fact, even the, the uh, solar mission that was launched in 2009, that really, in a sense, kickstarted the solar revolution in India, talked about building uh, kind of industrial capabilities. But we really have not done very well on that green industrialization. To the extent we've actually have had the uh, engagement of private enterprises, it's much more focused on deployment rather than innovation. They basically are uh, importing a lot of the technologies, although more recently, 
there have been a, a focus on developing local manufacturing capabilities through production linked incentives. I should say because, in my view, because we've been focused at meeting these very, very ambitious targets very quickly. Uh, unfortunately, the energy access objectives have been a little bit sidelined. Uh, and so I think this is what I was talking about, the tension between climate and development imperatives. If, you're, if, if in this case, because you're making a very, very strong push for, for climate mitigation, um, energy access uh, kind of falls by the way, wayside. And as I said earlier, that effectively our development of our innovation and interest, industrial base has been constrained by, I would say, both a lack of appropriate strategy, but also the limited science and technology capabilities, as I was just illustrating a few slides ago. Uh, next slide, please. So with that backdrop, maybe a couple of slides on, on, on what, what is it that we could do in order to manage this clean energy uh, transition, um, transition better. Next slide. I talked about the fact that we didn't really have maybe as a comprehensive and systematic a strategy as um, uh, one, one would have liked. Uh, I'm putting up what I think is my view of what's a systematic approach to energy innovation. And it really, like all of policy studies, it really starts by, by a clear framing of the problem. What are our objectives and strategies? And, and this sounds trivial, but in some sense, it goes back to the point I was just making two minutes ago. If you're thinking about this massive push towards solar, are we thinking of this as um, um, climate mitigation, uh, uh, kind of climate mitigation driven uh, approach? Is it uh, energy security driven approach? Are we trying to make sure that we are more, more uh, kind of energy secure? Is it what is the role of energy access and what is the role of, of building a green industry? I mean, so there are actually four possible objectives of our uh, path forward in solar and a path in recent years in solar. The question is, how do you then attribute different weights to those different objectives? I think that becomes an absolutely key question. And I think we've kind of talked about all four, but I'm not sure that we have really in some senses being able to uh, put together a policies uh, that are able to appropriately underpin those mix of objectives. Uh, but once you've got the objectives all uh, thought through and the strategies, then you have to think about how to implement. Actually, we've done fairly well on some of this in our solar um, uh, uh, pathway. We've driven down the prices quite quickly. Uh, very early in the solar mission, we talked about this um, reverse auctions that did a price discovery and really drove down the price of price of solar deployment. So we're actually fairly good at designing implementation pathways, but it's obviously very, very complicated stuff. You have to think about, as I said, uh, technologies, business models, early market creation, scale up, uh, all of these different pieces. And uh, I think I should, maybe I kind of didn't highlight it earlier, but what I'm calling what I'm calling the clean energy transition really is going to be multiple uh, clean energy transitions. There's a renewables transition. There's going to be a transition that's going to happen in the transportation sector. There's a trans trans uh, transition relating to renewables that's going to happen in storage. Uh, it's going to lead to a transition also in your industrial uh, infrastructure, uh, in your buildings. So in some senses, we really are talking about multiple transitions that are going to be happening in parallel and turns out to be you know, kind of a complicated problem, as you can imagine, and uh, not easy to be designing implementation pathways uh, very well on all of that. We've done well on some. We've not done well on some other uh, thing. Um, uh, and then, of course, implementation, which is the real kind of operational side of things, and then learning from all of this experience. And I want to just emphasize that last one because in, we're I think do not invest as much as we should in learning from experience by doing a systematic assessment of analysis to learn how to do better. Uh, the reality is, as I mentioned earlier, this energy trans uh, clean energy transition is going to be multi, it's going to be a multi-decadal transition. And therefore we've got to put in place the kinds of capabilities to make sure that we are learning from how we are doing and constantly improving. Uh, I think it's going to be absolutely key to to us being able to meet our challenges in an effective manner. And uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm, I'm going to end with this. Um, I'm sorry, I think I've, I've been probably speaking very fast in in a uh, effort to try to leave enough time for uh, for discussion. But just to just to sum up, I think I think it should be pretty um, obvious to everyone. Uh, probably even was obvious even before the talk, but hopefully the talk has has re-emphasized that that the energy sector globally and in India is facing this complex cha cha uh, challenge of uh, managing major uh, climate and energy imperatives in a very short time frame. So again, major imperatives, the and, it means they have to think about climate and development at the same time and in a short time frame. But there's also an opportunity here to build a clean energy industry and therefore contribute not only to mitigating climate change, but also to our economic development and economic competitiveness. But it really requires a strategic perspective. We have to think about what is the role and organization of public investments in energy uh, R&D. Uh, we have to figure out ways of better promoting private energy R&D investments. As I said, most of the focus right now is on deployment. And in the long run, we have to make sure that we are able to become innovators in this space. Um, and uh, labs like NCL, I think, can play a very, very important role in both uh, doing innovative R&D, but also working with industry or driving industry to, to uh, become more innovative or partnering with them. Um, we have to leverage our markets. India has very, very large markets that are attractive for a lot of international players. We've already started doing that in some way, but I think there's much more we can be, that can be done to enhance international knowledge and partnerships. A lot of the focus right now seems to be on deployment and on manufacturing, but I think we also need to focus much more on building our energy innovation capabilities through these kind of partnerships. And the last, I would actually say that um, we have to have a much more explicit development of industrial policy coupled to research policy. I keep on coming back to that, that I think in the end, for us, the end game has to be to strengthen our, our energy innovation system so that we are able to, in some senses, be players in this global uh, clean energy landscape as it as it evolves. And of course, as all of you know, clean energy really cannot be thought of uh, separate from the rest of the uh, innovation ecosystem, uh, which of course means we have to think about innovation much more systematically in India. Uh, we were, uh, uh, I guess there was uh, this kind of draft science technology innovation policy that uh, unfortunately seems to have um, uh, seems to be in the doldrums currently. Hopefully some version of that will uh, be released uh, in the next coming years, next coming months, hopefully, or, or uh, soon, uh, so that there is a little bit greater focus on science, technology, innovation policy more broadly in the country. And of course, uh, I think the role of higher education and research is absolutely central here uh, in contributing to this kind of um, uh, enterprise in many different ways. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry for um, probably putting out a lot of data and thoughts out there, uh, but hopefully there'll be at least some time for a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Ambuch. Thanks. Uh, very, very wonderful uh, summary of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of numbers, but all of them absolutely important, but the takeaways from your slides were, were excellent. Uh, I'm going to leave this forum to to more of discussions and, and questions. Uh, so if I can escape the slideshow, if that is OK with uh, yes, yes. others so that I can see the uh, participants. OK, great. So uh, questions, if you want to ask, please raise your hand and I will take them in the uh, in, in the order of uh, priority of questions that were asked them. Uh, first come first, sir, sort of. Um, to just open up uh, the discussion, Sambuj, uh, let me begin by asking you before the other hands come up. Uh, there's this issue of even for implementation in India, uh, which we are going ahead with clearly R&D is at the little back seat, but implementation is already happening. Uh, still struggling with supply chain issues, right? I mean, we're saying solar 500 gigahertz, uh, gigawatts uh, hours, but um, you know, all of those are coming from China uh, and so on. So uh, if we go with batteries and if lithium is where we will drive at, again, all the supply chain issues will come up. Even for implementation, things are not easy. 
when it comes to supply chain issues. Uh, do you know if there are that there are there is a clear there is a clear thinking about it? Uh, that's question one. And the second was you mentioned about you know renewable electricity rather than renewable energy, and I agree with that. I think solar and all is basically focusing on renewable electricity. Uh, while that is fine, the local infrastructure for transmission distribution of electricity, you know, the local transformers, the local lines, that kind of local infrastructure is still a problem uh, in India. So how efficiently will we will we be able to deliver even renewable electricity uh, is, is a question. And are you aware of any major policy issues in that direction? So focus on implementation. Supply chain is one problem. Local infrastructure is the other. Uh, are there major uh, policy changes that you see happening in India? So just to answer your question, I think I think you know. Look, the reality is it's it's a very uh, tough position to be in. I think we are, in some senses, uh, to my mind, as I said, I think it all goes back to what what I mentioned earlier, right? We are we're effectively a country that's a kind of a relatively poor country. I mean, we've been, you know, our GDP has grown a lot in the last few decades, but we are still a poor country with fairly limited uh, uh, capabilities, human capabilities, institutional capabilities, financial capabilities. Uh, and yet we are actually moving at a pace in terms of the deployment of these new technologies, which is a fairly, to my mind, a, a, maybe an overly rapid pace, right? And I think it, it creates a little bit of a problem that, um, that you know, as, as, as I think as the kind of the, um, uh, the line goes, you know, it's, it's your, one is having to tie one's shoelaces while running. And so they've been there, uh, as I said, I think there've been some very good things that happened. You know, for example, we are at least have driven down the price of solar deployment. But having said that, I, I, you know, we, as you know, we struggled for years on things like uh, building manufacturing capability. Uh, well, that was always meant to be one of the goals of our solar uh, mission. Uh, we really did not do well. It's only recently that I think the government is making a huge push on that. Uh, and uh, and of course, with all the supply chain issues of the kind you mentioned, which have not obviously been made any easier in the COVID times. Um, I think we're, this seems to be, Again, I'm, I'm saying this only from the outside. I think there seems to be a slightly more concerted effort at sorting this out um, it, and, and really building up our manufacturing capabilities. I think the thing that I really worry about is that we're kind of behind the curve already. You know, we're, we certainly hopefully will be able to build up the manufacturing capabilities and the supply chains to uh, take care of our deployment. But I worry that we're, we've kind of lost the wind of opportunity already to become global players. Uh, I mean, China, has, as you all know, has been very, very nimble at this and extremely aggressive in the last decade that they really came out of nowhere and have, have grabbed a, a fairly large share of the global pie. But of course, they're not the only ones. Um, and so so I, 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 think, I think the jury is out on this. I mean, I, I'm hoping we're certainly going to be doing much better. But I think where we are going to be in our positioning compared to the global players, I, I think is something that is going to be seen. But I am heartened by the fact that I think we're now being much more aggressive in thinking about these kind of issues relating to implementation. Um, and sorry, what was your other question was about? Um, so local infrastructure, right? I mean, oh, yes, about written, yes, 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 yes. Again, a huge problem. You know the thing is, you can you can pump a little bit of intermittent renewables into the grid, uh, but beyond a certain point, the grid management and storage becomes a really complicated question. And uh, our grid is already not you know it's it's not that it's uh, it's it's totally ship shape. Uh, uh, so I think I think that's going to require a lot of attention. Uh, we are you know it's it's it's, it's as I said it's a lot of transitions that have to happen in parallel. Right, you can't think about the renewable transition, as you said, without thinking about the infrastructure transition. But that also requires thinking about the storage transition. Uh, and then you're thinking, and the question is, are you going to do storage, whether at the grid level, or whether you're going to do storage at a distributed level, which links to the electric vehicles, because 
if you're thinking about electric vehicles as a kind of a storage uh, option, um, a distributed storage option, then that strategy also has to be linked. It really is an extremely complicated story. And as I said, multiple interlinked transitions. Uh, most countries are struggling with this in some way, which is exactly why we are not meeting the global targets that we want to be meeting. Uh, are we doing things? I think we are certainly doing some things in, in, that uh, engage with each of these each of these transitions. Um, my big concern is my big concern is that a lot of the because of the focus on extremely rapid deployment, we are basically just much more in uh, putting our attention to the short term, the here and now, making sure the capacity is installed. And I think it is maybe diverting at least some attention from the longer term innovation capabilities that I think need to be built up. And, um, and to me, that's actually the tricky, the really tricky thing, uh, which of course adds only to the complexity of the challenge, because not only am I, am I saying we have to think about the kind of the interlinked uh, set of the challenges in these various domains that I just mentioned, but also to be thinking about the longer term innovation capabilities, but I think we have no choice uh, if we want to um, be part of the longer term story on uh, the clean energy, uh, the global clean energy landscape. So Ambuj, the reason I asked that question yeah. was, you know, uh, what India has managed to do, for example, in digitization, right? When the, di when the digital infrastructure was opened out to private, when it was privatized, uh, we made immense and extremely rapid progress very fast and at scale right uh, geo came out of that for example right uh, what was only bsnl earlier now look at where we are in terms of uh, digital access both access and affordability uh, but you know do you think that needs to happen for electrical electricity supply and distribution uh, yeah. which is totally in private i mean uh, public control today can that be scaled up rapidly uh, you know, with privatization. Ashish, Ashish, I think the digital story is a little bit different in the following way. You know, we got into the digital game uh, much later, as I see it at least, much later in the technology cycle. So in other words, investments, R&D investments in industrialized countries had already massively driven down the prices. And of course, we then, of, we were actually fairly creative in providing digital services to people at lower costs, but we kind of came into it much later on in the technology cycle. Um, in the renewable story, we're in some senses uh, getting into the game much earlier in the technology cycle so that um, um, the prices not have, the prices, the costs and prices have not come down as much as they had in the digital space. What's also complicated the story is two other things, right? One is the fact that uh, we actually have a massive existing infrastructure. And uh, in the digital, we didn't have to deal as much with the legacy infrastructure. Uh, and the second thing is that effectively, because if you think about it, uh, ele uh, electricity, it's we already have a source of cheap electricity, which is coal. And uh, in some senses, so the reason we're moving to renewables is for public goods reasons. We are basically saying it's, we're willing to pay a higher price because it's a public good thing and, and therefore something that's beneficial for everyone. Uh, but it turns out to be, you know, financially much more, much more expensive. In the digital space, actually you had consumers who didn't have a cheaper alternative, so to speak. And so they were at least, you know, you had, first of all, the higher paying consumers within the country that could, help with the deployment of the digital infrastructure that then drove down the prices. So I think there are some lessons to be learned from the digital space, but uh, I think it is it's it is somewhat different stories, if you, if you see what I'm saying. Fully understand. Uh, these are difficult, very difficult problem, and there's no one way, I mean, the one easy way to learn from digitization experience and translate it to uh, energy, uh, no distribution infrastructure. And, uh, and if it makes us feel better, we're not the only ones struggling with this transition. <laughs> right. Uh, I have, you know, I see a few hands. Uh, Dr. Gopinath. Uh, 
please go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah this, this is Gopinath up from uh, the division of NCL. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's a wonderful talk and uh, thanks to uh, Ms. Sagar. Uh, in fact, I agree with you that uh, you know our political as well as commercial executives don't have the long term vision actually. In fact, we, uh, in the clean energy transition, it looks like you know we are already you know up the bar to a large extent, I would say actually. Uh, my question is actually what would be the policy to deal with the huge infrastructure available with the you know oil and coal sector and do you also expect a backlash from them to the policy of clean energy transition <laughs> that's a very difficult question you know people are now talking about this notion of uh, by the way again this is not only an indian problem this is a problem in all most countries and uh, by the way, including the United States. And so people are now beginning to talk about this notion of what they're calling a just transition. That is, how do you do this transition while also taking care of communities and industries like the coal and oil industry that basically is going to um, have stranded assets? There are people who are going to be put out of employment. And, uh, and now people are talking about actually keeping many of these uh, uh, energy fossil resources in the ground, which effectively, so in a sense, things that had monetary value are now not going to be monetized, right? And so it has enormous, um, uh, not just economic, but actually uh, human implications. I mean, if you think about India with the number of people who are employed by the coal industry in some of the poorest states of India, it becomes a really, really tricky question. And uh, and then there are countries like Saudi Arabia that are actually saying that, you know, or Indonesia, that are huge fossil resources that are talking about, you know, uh, it, it being inherently unfair that they're being told not to exploit those, those resources. Uh, this is something, this has now become, in the last few years, has become a very important part of the, global policy conversations that how do you think about a financial architecture that may at least soften the blow for for these groups um, richer countries can do it through in, internal kind of you know some internal kind of flows uh, so the us can actually say fine we'll you know we'll kind of uh, soften the blow for coal miners although there are not that many coal miners in the united states i think only about 40 to 50000 left uh, because it's highly mechanized. So we are not talking about a huge number of people. Uh, but again, it's, it's in some very key states. It's the same in India, right? Yeah, but the numbers are much, much larger. Um, yes, there is, of course, there's going to be pushback from those from those uh, individuals, from those companies, from the states. But, you know, the reality is we have no choice. I, I think it's I think this is where we are going to have to make some very hard choices because like it or not, fossil fuels are on the way out. They may continue to be part of an energy future, but it's certainly going to be a smaller and smaller part of the energy future. And we have no choice but to bite the bullet and think about how do you, um, how do you manage this? I, one more problem in India is a lot of the renewable energy resources are in the West and the South. And the coal, for example, is in the different part of the country, right? So it also sets up a different political economy, right? That is not just, it's, it's also a shift of revenue, so to speak, from one part of the country to another part of the country. I think it's going to be a really uh, complicated challenge for us. We are in some sense, some senses now beginning to think about other ways to use uh, coal resources, for example, coal to liquids, you know, methanol or or a, a something else. We are even, I think, talking about other you know kind of uses for coal, uh, but it's going to be a tricky thing because it's just a very expensive route to trying to use your energy source. Uh, so I think while we're while we're talking about that, uh, eventually there is no question that we're going to have to reduce our dependence on these on these uh, resources, and we are going to have to talk about those kind of questions that you that you alluded to. Thank you. Just one, one more quick question. Actually, in fact, uh, what Ashish asked actually uh, regarding that uh, we should allow more private players to 
take this energy transition to happen in India, actually. Because otherwise, you know, I don't think government is going to spend more money in this. Uh, I mean, uh, the whole R&D sector, I don't think government will spend more and more, actually. It is already 0.7 percentage of GDP and coming down, actually. So it is not never increasing for the at least for the last 10, 15 years, actually. So uh, it is uh, probably, you know, we may have to allow uh, this energy transition really to happen quickly. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, uh, I mean, it's going to take more time. Actually, that's uh, uh, I agree with Ashish actually. But maybe what's your take on? So you know, my my take on this is, I think our private sector has kind of dropped the ball, right? It really it's wrapped up its investments a little bit, but not significantly at all. I had a slide that I didn't show that I dropped. I didn't I put it in the slide pack of comparing Indian companies to their foreign counterparts in terms of their R&D investments uh, as a fraction of their revenues, right? Our firms are under investing in R&D. Uh, for a long time, it was a protected economy, so they didn't care. Uh, now that economy has been opened up, yes, still some of the some of the players have actually, some, like for example, the car industry has increased its investment significantly, but still, you know, uh, our car industry may be spending, you know, uh, I don't re remember the latest numbers, but a Tata or Mahindra may be spending uh, one or two hundred million dollars a year on R&D. If that, Toyota spends ten billion dollars, right? So it, it actually, we really have to find ways of, in, of incentivizing industry to uh, increase its R&D investments. Unfortunately, none of it seems to have worked in the past. All the Incentives given to industry have not worked, and I, I, um, I, frankly, I don't know the answer to that question of how do you. Uh, I think it's not about getting the industry to participate. I think it's making sure that they are making the investments in innovation to be able to participate in a different way. So far, the industry participation is getting a part of the deployment market, right? So again, it's a low-hanging fruit. Is getting the profits without actually thinking about the longer term future. Future, by the way, I and going back to the digi digital story. I have the same concern about India's digital titans, right? All the big digital companies. We've kind of reaped the benefit of uh, global outsourcing, but in the end, I don't think we've really those companies are going to become global leading global innovators in the digital space, like a Google or something else or a Microsoft. So uh, I, I think this is this is really a, a a big problem, and I don't see industry groups like the Confederation Confederation of Indian Industry really talking about it any seriousness. I mean, at CII, innovation is kind of you know relegated to the corners. They're always talking about markets and what policies and incentives the government can give uh, to increase the market shares. But I, I think it's 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 really a narrow term perspective. Yeah, thank you. Amuch, uh, it's 12.20 almost. You had told me that you had a hard stop and you have another. Why Why don't we go on for another, another 10 minutes? And at 12.30, it's a hard stop for sure. All right. OK, great. Uh, there's another hand from Dr. Selva Raj. Uh, go ahead, Selva. Plus, keep your questions short. So we have another question also coming up. Sure, Ashish. Uh, this is Selva Raj from Catalysis, having a you know, hydrogen in the mind working in that. Uh, I have two questions to you, and um, it's very interesting to hear from you on the data that is available. Specific to India, still a lot known data is there. So um, the question is that, given the given, given the aspirations of India on multiple priorities, uh, how much do you think that India should be still aggressive in pushing clean energy transition? at the cost of uh, changes in other priorities. Uh, that is my first question. I mean, what would be finally like, you know, I mean, will that be a kind of loss uh, for India in terms of implementing uh, aggressively the clean energy transition? Uh, the second question is that, uh, what do you think as a single largest uh, stumbling block for India to quickly implement uh, energy transition? So to, to answer your first question, I don't think we have any choice. I think every country is going to have to undergo 
this clean energy transition some some at slower pace slower speed than the others but i don't think there, there is no choice i think uh, we're already beginning to see some of the manifestations of climate change globally india is actually fairly vulnerable country in terms of both the kind of impacts we're going to be feeling and the kind of uh, capabilities you have to deal with those impacts to mitigate those impacts so uh, it is in our own interest to uh, be part of the global community to uh, drive this clean energy uh, energy transition i think the question that really becomes that i try to kind of highlight in my talk in the in the kind of the very brief time we had available is in what way are we going to engage with the transition right are we just going to be deployers of technology or are we going to become uh, innovators at least in some pieces of the overall global value chain so that we can we can actually get benefit from some part of that enormous clean energy technology market that is going to be uh, building up in the in the next many years a lot of countries have begun to understand this and for them actually the clean energy transition is as much anything else a uh, industrial competitiveness issue they want to make sure that their industries are competitive in the energy technology space in the coming years uh, and i think as i said we are still not taken that aggressive an approach on that there are some bits and pieces but certainly not as ag aggressive an approach as the guys are showing south korea uh, china and the united states and europe of course are are leading here uh, so i i think uh, to me the question is not if uh uh in a clean energy transition it's the how clean energy transition um and uh, sorry again i have forgot your second question what do you think as a single largest uh, single large this oh i don't think there's a single largest i think uh, you know the, the thing is we have our the context in which we are doing it which i said is very fast and large scale that sets up a whole set of challenges so i'm not sure i could say anyone i mean if i had to say one of course it's money because if you have you have a very large amount of money available if the international community made a very large amount of money available to us i think that would of course solve at least some of the problems by by facilitating a lot of things but that's not going to happen uh, the reality is in the global climate policy space the industrialized countries that were supposed to make available the resources to help developing countries such as india and many other countries actually uh, undertake the climate transition those funds have just not been forthcoming uh, the real reality is they've all reneged on their promises because they know that in the end it is in the interest of these countries to undertake these transitions themselves and they will have to use it with domestic funds so so unfortunately i think money of course is is would would be the greatest facilitator if it was much larger amounts larger amounts made available to us but as i said i don't think it's forth going to be forthcoming from the international community so we're going to have to figure out how to undertake this transition with the resources available to us but this is why i think this is why to me the learning and assessment that i talked about becomes particularly important because it's imperative that we undertake this transition as effectively and as productively as possible you know and that's why i was talking earlier about the kind of this strategic approach and all of that and for example how do we think about leveraging international partnerships uh, knowledge partnerships with all of that uh, we do this in bits and pieces but not as systematically as we need to thank you thank very you much Abhuj, one last question from dr chetan gargil chetan go ahead thanks for a nice talk i have actually two questions one is uh, related to india and the question there is that if you look at a specific target let us say the 2050 goal uh, what fraction of that goal can be achieved by upgrading our uh, uh, let's say extraction distribution production of existing electricity to international standards Uh, and the other question is more a uh, accounting question of uh, in order to achieve a certain goal you know where where is the envelope drawn so is for example is the carbon 
uh, utilization reduction in Germany offset by the increase in the uh, uh, utilization or you know, in the production in China where the solar panels are met. So a life cycle analysis, where is that developed? So those okay. Are uh, yeah, uh, okay. Um, you know, okay, let's, let me take the life cycle. You know, that, that question of the embedded carbon is a very complicated one. So far, when people are talking about, let's say, net zero, in a very simplistic way, it is really the emissions of carbon from within your national territory. And uh, they're talking about that emissions basically effectively going to zero. So not zero, but that's why they're saying net zero, right? Because there's an assumption that you are going to continue to emit, but some fraction of your emissions are going to, enough of your emissions are going to be offset by air capture or some kind of uh, capture and storage technologies that if, effectively it will make you net zero. But as I said, that's not taking into account the embedded carbon in the goods and services being traded, right? So in other words, am I going to just be able to uh, offshore my emissions by just buying more goods and services from other countries and producing less? Uh, I, there's already many conversations on this and thinking about how to deal with this notions of uh, embedded carbon. Um, and eventually, I think we are going to have to think about that. But for the time being, I think it's already tough enough to think about a kind of a net zero from, from your own territory and uh, being able to reduce your emissions enough that the remainder can actually be offset by uh, capture and storage. By the way, those capture and storage technologies that every global scenario is counting on to get to net zero, those capture and storage technologies really are in the demonstration and prototype phase. And we are pinning our hopes on that, but it's not clear that we, those technologies are going to be able to capture carbon at the scale that's going to be required, despite huge efforts to reduce our emissions. So uh, honestly, it's we're pinning a lot of hope on that, but I must confess many people, including myself, are a little bit skeptical that we're going to be able to have a technological revolution that really allows us to capture billions of tons of carbon a year um, uh, from, the, from, the, from the atmosphere. Uh, as you can imagine, a very complicated problem, both the capture and then the storage. Uh, on your first question, uh, you know, Yes, we can certainly improve the efficiency of uh, our coal conversion, uh, but it can only take you so far. Uh, so, you know, it, it gives you some more breathing room uh, and by basically reducing the amount of emissions per unit GDP if you are using your coal, uh, for example, much more efficiently. Uh, but in the end, you know, there's limits to how much you can do. And there is no way we are going to be able to get anywhere close to the uh, 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 the targets that we have set for ourselves, you know, net zero by 2070, which is the India target, uh, or net zero by 2050, which is the global target. There's no way we are going to be able to come anywhere close to those targets if we continue to have this massive reliance on fossil fuels. So uh, I think there's no doubt that we have to we have to be using those fossil fuels much much more efficiently. Um, and many of our coal plants, for example, are still uh, fairly inefficient. Uh, we lose uh, energy in transmission and distribution. How we use energy in our homes is still very inefficient. Although, for example, we've done fairly good with LED, but our buildings are very in inefficient. So in all the conversion, uh, transportation and, and end use, there's much more that can be done. But in the end, I, I think we have no choice, but uh, the writing is on the wall. I think fossil fuels, uh, we have to. We are going to have to start moving away from fossil fuels. At what rate will depend on this question of the just transition that I alluded to earlier. Uh, but there's no doubt that we are, we are going to be we are going to be doing that. Thank you. Great, Ambuj. It's exactly 12:30. I think you have to stop if you want to get to the next meeting. We are yes, happy to yes. have you on the call for as long as we want. <laughs> But in in interest of time, Ambush, thank you so much for spending an hour and a half. I'm sorry for the initial hiccups uh, on this MS Teams platforms, but I think finally we managed to to hear you out. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a wonderful chat, and and these discussions 
sort of are never ending, right? At least initially yeah. they can go on. And I hope we have another opportunity for you to maybe come over in person and have more detailed conversations with uh, the larger team here. So thank you so much. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, all the organizers for this uh, event, uh, the uh, publication science communication team uh, and all the others, Sarika, for example, uh, Asha, who helped uh, communicate with you and, and trouble you with getting your CVs and stuff like that. So uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. I think we've had a great seminar uh, and this was uh, a very nice uh, uh, event where, you know, Although it was a science day, uh, today science is is very important because it it is it's critical to help develop the right policies for this very important uh, energy and climate transitions that we are trying to go through. So uh, it was, I think, a very unique way of understanding how science uh, is is very important to these uh, solving these big issues. Uh, so thank you, Ambuj, again, and I hope to see you once again at at NCL next time in person. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And thanks to all your uh, colleagues for being so patient while we, had, while we were sorting out the technical glitches. But, uh, but thank you for uh, giving me this chance and also for a very engaging discussion with your colleagues. And Yashish, yes, hope to see you in Pune at some point or in Delhi. Thank you so much, Anish. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Once again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. -bye.